Well, as you remain standing, let's pray. I'm going to use again the prayer that we've already had read for us this morning, the second Sunday in Advent Collect. So helpful it is as a reminder in a really difficult part of Scripture that we ought not let the appalling behaviour of the human characters tarnish the consistent goodness of God and his word. In fact, it's when our ugliness is most on display that God's stunning, stunning steadfast love and his goodness shines through most clearly. So let's pray together. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please grab a seat? And again, welcome to church. I'll add my welcome to John's as well. It's great to have you here, especially if you're visiting or here for one of your first times. My name's Kurt. I'm one of the assistant ministers here. And as we've just prayed in that prayer, there's a passage of scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, which reads, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. You probably know that passage of scripture. It's one that we we often cite. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for our righteousness? It's an important question because by the end of Genesis chapter 34 alone, the first of our two chapters in this final sermon, at least for now in this Genesis series, This story of God and us, by the end of the first of our two chapters alone, we'll have seen the defiling of a daughter, the dithering of a father, the brutality of the brothers, the soiling of a sacrament, and the annihilation of a nation. And yet who can dare to fathom the mysteries and the contradictions of the human heart, let alone plumb the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God? How unsearchable his judgments, how unscrutable his ways. They're the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 11. For out of this rotten stump of Jacob, the nation of Israel will emerge. Genesis chapter 35 verse 10 No longer will you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And what's more, the Lord says to Jacob in the wake of this appalling mess of chapter 34, in the very next chapter, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall spring from you. And so by the end of these two tumultuous chapters, though Dina lie defiled and Jacob compromised and his sons culpable and Shechem ravaged and Rachel perished and Reuben inflamed and Isaac dead, still the nation of Israel shall be firmly established in the tabling of Jacob's 12 sons by name And the passage of the Lord's covenant promises and covenant people secured, at least for the next generation to come. Now there is no question that these parts of scripture are confronting. But if you're here today, if you're here today and you want proof that our God is more than capable of taking the dry and hopeless bones of broken people, bad people, dead people, dead in their transgression and sin, people like me and us. If you want proof that God is more than capable of taking people like that, 
and breathing life into them and saying, live. Then you need only have your Bibles open in Genesis chapters 34 and 35. Because over the last few weeks in Genesis, we've been tracking this much-anticipated homecoming of Jacob, our prodigal son of the promise. Coming to his senses, so to speak, in the far country of Haran, breaking free from the harsh rule of the uncle-come-father-in-law Laban and setting his face at last towards his father's home in Canaan. And what a reception. Do you remember? In Jesus' version of the story, it's the father who comes running out to meet his lost boy while the older brother sulks out the back. But here in the Genesis version, it was the older brother Esau, do you remember? Who comes running out to meet his prodigal brother. And he greets him with open arms. Genesis chapter 3 verse 4, Esau runs and embraces him. And he falls on his neck and kisses him and they wept. And instead of revenge... It's unspeakable mercy, God-like mercy from this twice-defrauded older brother. And yet still at Jacob's insistence, they had gone their separate ways. Esau on ahead to Seir, and then Jacob, he snatches one final trick on his older brother as he turns aside to finally settle at Shechem, just 30-odd kilometres shy of Bethel. Now sure, he didn't quite make it to Bethel, And the final reunion with his father still lies ahead of him. But for all intents and purposes, this prodigal son is home. Let the celebrations begin. Then Genesis chapter 34, verse 1. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the region. And when Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite prince of the region, saw her, he seized her and lay with her by force. Like a gunshot down a crowded school corridor or a homemade explosive loaded with shrapnel detonated in a crowded shopping strip full of families and holiday makers, just ordinary people going home from work. It is brutal. It's inexcusable. And this appalling act of violence against Dina, the only daughter of Jacob, seems to have come completely out of the blue. But for every party, there's always a morning after. And it is a mess here in the land of Shechem. But worse still, it's only the first of a series of appalling acts that completely destroy any semblance of peace for this prodigal family come home. Because first there is this appalling defiling of a daughter in verse 2, but equally appalling, no less excusable, is the dithering of a dad, which we see in verse 5, if you have a look there, Jacob's cool silence in the wake of the violent act against his own flesh and blood. Verse 5, Jacob heard. Jacob heard. And how does he respond? Jacob held his peace. Literally, he remained deaf to his daughter. Sure, he might have been outnumbered. Sure, wisdom might have told him to wait till his boys came back from the field. But since when does wisdom come into the equation when a father sees his daughter in harm's way? And while Jacob fiddled, Dina's brothers burned. Because when they arrive home, did you see there in verse 6? They find Jacob bargaining with the father of the man who had raped their sister. And they are inflamed with anger.
And so like father, like sons, over in verse 13 now, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dina. Like father, Jacob the deceiver, so his 12 sons. And mingled with their deceit comes a fourth atrocity, more subtle than the rest, but no less appalling. That is the cheapening or the devaluing of the God-given gift of circumcision. A holy sign and seal of the covenant promises that were first given to Abram by God back in Genesis chapter 17. It was a while back now. Do you remember when the Lord had said to Abram, Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. Sound familiar again from our passage today? But then back in chapter 17 and in verse number 10, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, And your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant, a sign of the covenant between me and you. And so what was first given by God to all the sons of Abraham, Jacob and his sons included, as a generous means of grace, becomes cheapened in the hands of the sons of Jacob as a shady means of deception. But there's still one final appalling act to come back in Genesis 34. Because on the third day when the men of Shechem were still in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the city unawares and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and made their prey. Just as brutal as Shechem's first act in their lust for revenge. But shockingly, grossly disproportionate in the scale of their response. Where it seems that nothing less than the annihilation of an entire nation, without the consent of Jacob, it seems, and completely devoid of any direct, completely devoid of any direct decree from God, let's make that clear, Only wholesale slaughter, it seems, would satisfy the lust for revenge that was burning in the hearts of Jacob's sons. And not that Jacob comes out of this mess any less culpable either. His abysmal silence, his self-absorption continues all the way through to the final verses of chapter 34. Did you notice them there as we made our way through? You've made, you brought trouble on me. I shall be attacked. I shall be destroyed. All he can think about is his own skin. But it's here, right at our lowest point, on our darkest day, even as Shechem smoulders, It's here that God speaks to these dry bones. 
And he says, live. See there in the very first verse, the very next chapter, chapter 35, verse 1. Where out of nowhere it would seem. The Lord says, get up. Arise. And this paralyzed prodigal son of the promise, until now crippled by his own inaction and his blatant desire for self-preservation, Jacob takes up his mat and he casts off his household gods calls his family to do the same. And they set off home, really home, together at last, to Bethel, the birthplace of his faith. And then the rest of the bones and the, the, the bits and pieces just come tumbling and clattering together as the chapter unfolds. Then comes the new name of Israel again followed by the promise of a nation again and kings. Yet another pillar at Bethel again and then the names of the 12 sons listed out again. But now these are not just the names of the sons of Jacob. These are the sons of Israel. The birth of a nation. And the rest, as they say, is salvation history. The history of of the prodigal people of God. And I really mean it. The rest, the rest of the story, not just the Genesis story, but the whole story of the Bible is the history of the prodigal people of God. It's the story of God and us. And I know you know it. But the question is, do you believe it that not just all of this history, but even this particular part of the history, these two turbulent chapters of Scripture with all their appalling acts of violence, do you believe that even these bits are God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you believe it? That even this bit is for our good. Let me leave us with just two brief considerations. How is it that this part of the Bible is useful for our embracing of those Incredible promises that are ours in Christ. Firstly, consider the wickedness and violence of the human heart when left to its own devices. How easy is it for, it to, for us to sit here and condemn? And yet what shall we conclude then? Are we any better off? to use the phrase of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3? Not at all. There is no one righteous. Not even one. Indeed, as the prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 9, the human heart, my heart, by nature is deceitful above all things, Jacob-like, are our human hearts and beyond cure. And our violence against God, our violence against neighbour, our violence against self, not just the spectacularly appalling, but also the spectacularly everyday and mundane. It is no less abhorrent in our own lives. It is no less excusable either than the appalling displays of violence in these two chapters of Genesis. Let us never be self-deceived at how dark our own conduct would be 
apart from the restraining grace of God in our lives, through his word and spirit, through our life in community, by the preaching of the word and the sharing of the sacraments, all those beautiful, wonderful means of grace that God has given us, how dark our conduct would be without them, without this restraining grace of God in our own lives, let alone our own society or our world at large. And so first, consider the wickedness and violence of our own hearts. But second, consider the kindness and the sternness of God. Or perhaps better, the sternness and then the kindness of God. Sternness to those who fall, to use the phrase of Paul, again from Romans chapter 11. Sternness to those who fall, but kindness to those true sons of Jacob, those sons and daughters of the promise, who've been grafted into this ragtag nation of Israel by faith in Christ, even you and I. The sternness and the kindness of God provided, writes Paul in Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, provided that we continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. It reminds me of the words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, where he writes that if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, if he didn't spare the ancient world, even though he saved Noah, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man... And Peter doesn't write this, but if he even spared Jacob, the deceiver, and his 12 prodigal sons of violence, then the Lord, writes Peter, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And so as we close this series for now, the question still rises up. Where will our judgment quencher come from? Where will we look for our serpent crusher, our Noah-like comforter, our promised king? Not Reuben. He slept with his dad's mistress. Surely not Simeon and Levi. Their hands are still dripping red with blood. Well, who's next? Who's next in line? Couldn't be Judah. He's way down at number four. And hang on, isn't Joseph? Isn't Joseph meant to be daddy's favorite little boy? There are so many threads still hanging loose in this story of Genesis, this story of God and us. But guess what? You'll have to come back next year to find out how it finishes up. But even now, as we head to Christmas, as we look beyond Genesis and Jacob and Joseph, even Judah, to the true son of the promise this Christmas. O oh God, may we embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.